will is the ability to choose. And this is a luxury which always has consequences. God does not force himself upon us. He gives us a choice. But we're also accountable for that choice as well. Life or death. You see this in the book of uh, Deuteronomy at the end of it, the blessings and the curses that are there. I give you a choice, he says. Life or death, to love or to kill. This is extremely important for us to remember. Also another theme that I want to introduce at least at the very beginning here is on holiness. To be set apart for God. That's what holiness is. To be pure, but to be set apart from God, or for God, I should say. In the Exodus in Deuteronomy 6.23, it says, The Lord did mighty wonders in Egypt, humbling Pharaoh, and brought us out from there to bring us in. Isn't that interesting? He brought us out from there. He brought us out from Egypt so that he might bring us in, so that he might bring us in close and fulfill his great promises to us. And it says at the end of it, fear him for your own good that you might live long in the land. We're going to explore what that means to fear God because that is a healthy thing, believe it or not. And holiness is a very important part of the book of Leviticus. Unfortunately, that's a book that barely anybody ever wants to read because it has a lot of those things in it like you put a certain amount of salt in this sacrifice and then take a lamb and then you take a bull and you take some wine and it's just the same thing, a different sacrifice for a different purpose and people get bored with that. But the book of Leviticus is all about holiness and it's supposed to show us that this is absolutely essential to embrace the presence of God. We have to understand the importance of holiness. That carries over into the New Testament. That's one of those things that's just assumed. So when we say, I don't need the Old Testament, that's a lie because that's one of those things that's assumed you already understand. It doesn't go into that as much or as in-depth it is in there, but not as much as it does in the Old Testament. And in Leviticus 11, verse 44, it says, For I am the Lord your God. Set yourselves apart or consecrate yourselves as sacred, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. Isn't that interesting? God calls us out. He calls out His people from Egypt, the most powerful nation and technological nation in the world. He calls His people out from there to bring them in. And He says to them, Be holy because I am holy. I bring you out from there to bring you in close so that we become more like Him. God's people are saved for a purpose, to know Him, we get a front row seat to be awed at his work. Isn't that great? It's like that commercial, what is that? I must be in the front row, right? We do get the front row to watch God at work and then to reflect his likeness, being in his presence submissively. And this will transform us to become more like him. We do become more and more like the people that we hang around. And if we're hanging around God, we're going to become more and more like him as well. So background, before we get started here today, what we, we are in the book of Acts. We're um, in the, fourth, the end of the fourth chapter, about ready to go into the fifth chapter. And we've seen that the Holy Spirit has come upon all of God's people, those that have repented and submit to Jesus as king. He has come upon them in power and is doing some incredibly awesome work there. So if Jesus is the only path for salvation, which is what we saw last week, then the church's role to proclaim this good news and to teach people how to embrace it in truth is by far the most important entity and purpose on this whole earth. By far, nothing is more important and God is with them in power by the Holy Spirit. So the Sanhedrin, which is like the Supreme Court of Israel, has tried to intimidate Peter and John, two apostles, into stopping their witness to Jesus' resurrection. But they prayed for power and to be a bold witness 
to the truth, the good news of Jesus, and God answered them with power. He shook the foundations and continued to heal people, and many, many people are being transformed in uh, to the salvation of God and also given the Holy Spirit. So today we're going to look at five sections, expo I'm sorry, three sections exposing the importance of purity and the challenge of free will which exists in the church. The first section is union. The scriptures say on uh, verse 32 in chapter 4, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. So the full number of those who believe from last week, verse 4, is 5,000 people. Of one heart and soul, they were all on the same page. They were all unified in Christ through the teaching of the apostles, through prayer, through fellowship, breaking of bread, their identity, they all understood that was in Christ. They were of one heart and soul. They lived in harmony with each other. They cared for each other. The spiritual and material needs of early Christians were taken care of. Poverty was abolished. Isn't that amazing? When we get right with God first, our vertical relationship with God we will find that our horizontal relationships will become infinitely better. We need to first get right with God. Then the overflow will take care of each other without doubt. Why? Because He's transforming us into His likeness. We understand what our identity truly is and our purpose Despite the powerful opposition of the Sanhedrin, the presence of God was even stronger. Much greater power was with the apostles. Much greater. Even though with our eyes, we would look at them and say, wow, that's like one person or 12 people going up against the, the Supreme Court, you know? Good luck with that. It wasn't a rule the Christians could not own property, but it was rather a natural response of compassion. It was the overflow of the Holy Spirit from those who had much to help the needy. They felt compelled by the Spirit of God. And this is always an effect of true faith. We will have compassion on our brothers and sisters more even if they are our enemies because we can see that they are created in the image of God. We will have compassion on them more, but definitely for those that are believers as well. They understood that all that they had was a gift of God, everything. Therefore, they used it for the advancement and sustaining of God's kingdom on earth. They were true servants. Their things were not theirs. They ultimately were, they, if they felt compelled because someone had a need, then they would end up selling it and giving the proceeds then for the benefit of those that were in need. They were honored to participate in the advancement of God's kingdom. Honored. Those who say when it comes to stewardship time of the year, which I know is coming up at some point, I don't know when, but those who say, do I have to give to the church? Do I have to? Oh, I hate when they talk about sermons about giving. Or Do I have to give? Here's my answer. No, you do not. In fact, if you don't want to, I'm telling you right now, don't. God doesn't want your money. He don't need it. What He wants is a heart that wants to be part of his church, a part of his home, a part of his building. When Moses asked for contributions for the building of the tabernacle, it was by their own compelled spirit. It was by their own conviction. They willingly gave and they gave with grateful hearts. If we are bitter about our giving, keep it. You're going to need it more than the church will. Trust me. God will bring people that want to be a part of His church. People that are honored to be called into the advancement of His kingdom. People that say, He gave me everything that I have to begin with, and I know that He has plenty more to give. 
So I give to him first because I know that he's the giver of all things. And I honor him as God first. And I am honored to be a part of what he is doing here. So continuing, and this is what we see here. We have a choice, but our hearts have to be right with God. Our hearts have to be right. There are consequences for our choices. So 33, and with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Remember this, so great power and great grace. When we're willing servants, when we're submissive in heart at our core, then God will provide his presence abundantly and powerfully also. That goes from the Old and the New Testament, both. Material and spiritual blessings go hand in hand. Absolutely. It starts with our heart. In verse 29 through 30 last week, they prayed, all of the apostles and, and those that were with them, uh, so the community of the church, prayed for power to speak in truth about the bold, uh, speak in truth and in boldness despite the strong opposition against them. And we saw that God hears and he answers them abundantly. They're unified with God. They're in ministry with him, mission with him. Even the apostles are giving what they have, right? The testimony, boldly. If you don't think that's a, a risk or painful to give financially, their giving it jeopardizes their life. Yet they still are committed to giving to God first. More than anything. They're servants is what it comes down to. And what was the reward of it? Is that God's presence goes with them. Great power, great grace. Favor is the result of it. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. So here's, the, here's what God provided for everyone like manna in the, in the Exodus. With that, God says, don't take too much, don't take too little, you'll have enough. And that's what you see here is that there's enough for everyone. There is enough. When it says laid at their feet... That's an that's a image of submission that the people gave. He laid, they laid their possessions at the feet of the apostles. Number one, showing that they are in authority. They are representatives as far as for God. They trust them as far as with, their, with these proceeds. But it is absolutely an image of submission. And you're going to see this phrase used throughout our text here. So, thus, Joseph whose name means God shall add or increasing, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, who was a Levite. Now keep in mind, like I've said before, names give insight as to the character of the person, always in the Bible. Sometimes it's ironic, sometimes it absolutely they live up to their name. Barnabas here absolutely lives up to his name, and he has many names. So he is a, you see, he's a very good man, very godly man, very good character. And he's introduced here. He's an example of everything that we're hearing about. He's doing good with all of his heart. He's giving part of his property or yeah, some of his property he's giving to, to the church. He sold it and he's going to give it. So Joseph, again, his name means shall add or increasing, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas. So he was a son of encouragement. He was a Levite. That's a priest. He was a priest also of the people of God. And that name means to cleave to. He was one of God's shepherds who taught them how to cleave, how to cling to God. Cleave to and cling to is an imagery of marriage. He was a native of Cyprus. That means fairness. So he came from a nation of fairness. He's a good man. He sold a field that belonged to him and he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Even he submitted as a priest and a shepherd of God, he submitted to the apostles and gave what he had. This is the vision of what the church was always meant to be. This is the church pre-sin. This is Adam and Eve in the garden before Genesis 3. 
This is the church operating the way it was meant to be. Loving one another, there is no needs. Hearts are all committed to God, submissively. They're all servants. They take whatever they have. Whether If it's monetary, then it's monetary. If it's gifts of, of talent or if it's gifts of a, of a testimony, they give with their whole heart. They all had the same heart and soul. They were submissive to God and they followed His leading, whatever it was, and there was no one that lacked. Everyone had enough. God provided. That's what the church was meant to be. Even though they have strong enemies and opposition around them, the presence of God is providing for them everything that they need. They have peace internally. They got a lot of stuff going on outside, but they've got peace. And healing and abundance is there. When a child is an infant, relies on its parents for provisions. Now, granted, the parents might not get a lot of sleep. I understand that. But there is a, a relationship of love and peace that is there. And submission. But the terrible twos is a different story. Or the teenage years, right? The twos is the no or mine, right? Rebellion, especially the teenage years, can be very painful, right? It's where a child then starts to learn that they don't have to be tied to their parents anymore. I can be independent. In fact, I would like to be independent of my parents now. So I'm going to exercise that right, right. We see here things are the way they're supposed to be. Are we a church that operates as we were intended? Selflessly, and submissive and willing servants of God for the benefit of others in need, embracing God's word wholeheartedly and giving from our abundance. Are we true servants of God which want to be glorify, to glorify God through us? We want, we're honored to be a part of what he's doing. I hope that is always the prayer that is on our hearts. Second section is the husband the first sin of the church. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. So now a married couple are introduced. Adam and Eve. They're introduced into the section here. Ananias means Yahweh is gracious. That's what his name means. It's interesting because with great power and great grace was upon them all, right? Yahweh is gracious is Ananias. This is clearly going to be something that shows that he is not what his name lives up to be. Sapphira means sapphire, beautiful, pleasant. They sold a piece of property like Barnabas had done. So far, so good, right? But when you have two stories that go like this, they're usually not supposed to parallel each other identically. There's something wrong, something different that's there. One did it well, the other one, not so good. So the problem is, is that there wasn't a needy person among them in verse 34 of chapter 4 because all of them, some people sold property and brought the proceeds of what they had sold, laid them at the apostles' feet. In this text, though, they kept back. They robbed is what the word actually means in Greek for themselves. Some of the proceeds. And they laid them at the apostles' feet. So they want to look like they're submissive. Oh, holy am I for doing just like what Barnabas did. But they're being deceptive. They want to look like Barnabas. They want to be a person that is truly submissive to God. They looked up to him. They were in awe of him. But it was deceptive. Three examples of this same situation occurs in the Bible. This is a warning. These are all warnings in the Bible. This also is a warning. Genesis 3, the first sin, Adam and Eve, disobedience to God's instructions. That's the first one. Second one is in Joshua chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, Achan's sin. Achan actually, interestingly, means serpent. That's what his name means. 
serpent. How'd you like that name? Let's name our son Serpent. He has a good future ahead of him. <laughs> Trouble, anger, that's also what his name means. He steals from God, even though God said, leave the spoil from this war. This war. It's going to all be dedicated to God's temple. Achan takes some of it and he hides it in his tent. And now Israel is cursed. They cannot go against their enemies anymore because God is not with them. Someone in their camp didn't listen to them. So they're cursed until they deal and purge this evil from among them. Our text has the ability to destroy this pure state in the church. That's what should be brought to attention here. Sin has come in. What's going to happen? It could render them as useless. So continuing, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? So the Holy Spirit's now working through the apostles with great power and great grace. And Peter, led by the Holy Spirit, he senses what's going on here. And he calls out Ananias, Satan. That means the word, his name means adversary. He's the enemy of God and all of God's people. He's a liar. He's deceptive. That's what he does. And that's actually what Ananias and Sapphira are doing here as well. In chapter 4, verse 32, all 5,000 were of one heart and soul. They were surrendered to God as servants. No one said that anything was of his own. All were gifts from God. But here, verse 3, Peter says, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie? They were of one heart and soul, giving all of what they had. Why has Satan filled your heart? Instead of being filled by the Spirit of God, why has Satan filled your heart? Why have you allowed Satan to come in? to the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit should only be and keep, you decided to keep back for yourselves part of the proceeds. He's not fully surrendered. And Peter says here, it's not that you didn't have the right to do that, but you laid it at the apostles' feet like Barnabas did, thinking or wanting to be looked at like all of the proceeds were given just like Barnabas did. It was your property. You had the right to do that either way. But it shows they're truly not real servants of God. They're deceptive. They're trying to be deceptive. So Ananias worshipped two things here, the money and the recognition for being holy, a holy person. He wanted to keep control of what was happening. How often do we want to keep control of what's happening, right? God, just take my life except for this and this. And Lord, just work in my life except for these things here. And I need to still do this as well. It's not a total surrender. What's unfortunate is that it is a deception. And what's unfortunate is that the church has not taught this very well. And it's very hard for us to do. So when we ignore it, we become victims of this naturally. And we all are very vulnerable to this. Very vulnerable. In fact, I would say if we are not actively relying on God to help free us from this very thing, it will enslave us. And it separates us from God. It, it waters down the presence of God if we want Him to be powerful in our lives, we need to learn how to embrace the Spirit of God in its fullness, to truly surrender to Him. If He's Lord and Savior, we're not anymore. Doesn't mean we do nothing. There's nobody in the Bible, you don't see Moses saying, I'm going to go, I, God, you're God. I'm going to go back and lay on the couch. You go have it out with Pharaoh you're my God. You're the, you're the man. 
Go get them. God says, get out, go back to Egypt. He don't want to go back to Egypt. I don't really want to go back to... He, at one point, Moses says, get somebody else, right? I don't speak really well. I, I don't... What, what about this? And I... Uh, bu, 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 bu. Get over there. We always have certain things that we are called to do. We have a part to play, but there's a boundary we don't go beyond. That's God's territory, and we give that to Him. We carry a baggage many times that we were never meant to carry, and it crushes us because we were never meant to carry it. God's shoulders is more than enough to carry it all. He's the one that we have to learn to give it to and say, I've taken this as far as I can go. I can't go any further, nor do I want to. Because if I take this on my shoulders, it'll crush me. I was never made for this, but you are. So these words convicted and declared the sin upon Achan, and he fell like the fall of humanity in Genesis 3. His life expired. He breathed his last. It's interesting because breathe and spirit um, and wind are all the same word in Greek and also in Hebrew. He breathed his last. His spirit had its last, or the spirit of God left him, basically. Death overtook him. The curse recaptured him. Isn't that unfortunate? Paul talks about this. Why enslave yourself again to sin when you've been freed by Jesus Christ, by the blood of Christ? You've been freed. Live in freedom. Stop living. Go. Why go back to sin? Why go back to that? Why enslave yourself? The curse recaptured him. Verse 33, great power and great grace was among everyone when things were good. But here, verse 5, now great fear. It's the result of the presence of God is awe, wonder, fear. Some people, they say, well, I don't understand why you have to fear God. Well, let me put it this way. If we don't fear Him, He will show us why we need to fear Him. If our understanding of fear of God brings us close to Him, it's healthy fear. If it's not, and it makes us run from Him, it's unhealthy fear. We don't understand it at all. It actually makes us run away from Him because we're afraid of His judgment. If we know God, then we know that He is wrathful and He is cosmic judge. And one day He will judge all evil and humanity is actually lined up to be in that judgment. But we also know that God is good and He prefers to love us. He, prefer, he goes so far, He gives His Son's life for us to be in His love as opposed to into His wrath. He says, you don't have to go through that. Just turn, repent, submit to me, walk with me, and I will teach you my ways. You don't have to live in my wrath, ever. You can live in my love. Submit to me, though. Isn't that what he said to Adam and Eve from the very beginning? Just listen to me. Just don't eat from that thing. And what did they think? God's holding something back from me. He's untrustworthy. He's not able to be trusted. He's holding something back. I mean, seriously, isn't that what we kind of are doing when we're like, God, I, I completely submit to you except for this. Or we have little strings that we kind of try and pull back. Right? Like we can't trust him. It's the same idea. So judgment that we see, God's people need to understand and we live in a world that says, well, I don't want to talk about the wrath of God or the fear of God. Let's just talk about His love. Let's just talk about His love. Here's what happens. When we do that, God put the text in there to show us that that fear of God is important because when we don't talk about it, we become victim to it. We don't fear Him anymore. What happens when you don't fear fire? You're going to get burned. And if you're really playing around with it, it could kill you. But yet fire has great attributes, right? It can give you light. It can get you out of the darkness. It can keep you warm. It has great qualities. But if you don't respect it, 
It will absolutely hurt you. That's exactly what it is here. We see in the Old Testament these kind of things are happening. Leviticus 10 verses 1 and 2, Nadab and Abihu, who are sons of Aaron, they present unauthorized fire in the tabernacle and they're consumed by fire. Right there. That's a bad day for Aaron, for sure, and for Nadab and Abihu. 2 Samuel verses, or chapter 6, verse 7, Uzzah was a priest who tried to study the ark of God when it was put on an ox-drawn cart when David was trying to bring the ark of the covenant into Jerusalem. And instead of being carried by Levites alone like God had told them, they put it on an ox-drawn cart so when he reached out to touch it, he was killed. The point is, is and David was a servant of God, the point is, is that David learned the hard way. Listen to me. Don't take my word lightly. Listen to me. I give it to you for a purpose. When we don't understand that, God is love. He don't care. It's okay. And we're going to end up like Nadab and Abihu or Uzzah. Or Ananias and Sapphira. Here's the fundamental truth reinforced here. God's people must know that they exist to serve Him, not vice versa. God isn't the God that I put in my pocket and I pull Him out whenever I want Him. We're the servants, He's the God, He's a good God. And He is worthy of our praise. And His love is much stronger than His wrath. But His wrath is pretty powerful also at the same point. We need to understand that. And all of the apostles, they say, they, in fact, even sometimes in their letters, they say, those of you who fear God, that's how they actually address the people of God. Those of you who walk carefully before God, who know Him, but honor Him, listen to Him, they follow Him. So God removes the sin of Ananias by removing him from the community. God protects his obedient community. He still does that. And a submissive church, he protects them from the strikes of Satan. Satan's trying to get in. He's trying to mess things up. But this is a group of people who fully in embrace God. Um, the closer, the, the more close the presence of God is, you see this in the Old Testament especially, and this is why it's important, that also the demand for holiness is stronger also. If we want the power of God to be mighty here, then we need to understand that holiness is important. Walking with Him, obeying Him, following Him. When we don't do that, He does back away more and more. Can we get forgiveness? Of course we can. That's why Jesus died on the cross. But when we're doing it without any respect at all, where we say, you know what? I know God don't like me doing this. I'm going to do it anyway. Why? Because I want to do it. That's why. And God's a forgiving God. He'll forgive me. Is that true? Yeah, of course it is. But there's consequences for that. That's the problem. We don't talk about that anymore nowadays. There's no consequences. Yeah, there is a consequence. If you murder somebody and you repent to God, will he forgive you? Yeah, if you really do, but you're still going to prison. There's a consequence that's still there. There is a consequence when we also sin, especially when we know what we're doing and God doesn't like it. His presence will definitely back off more and more, more and more. That's what we see that's happening here is he's protecting that from happening. He's not allowing that to happen in his church. He's protecting it. So, are we as a church a people who wholeheartedly submit to Jesus or do we try to mix in our worldliness, our control in with our commitment to Christ? My question is, who is really God in our lives? Is it really Jesus? That's the hardest part about Christianity, is surrender. When people say, it's so hard to be a Christian, the point is, is that that soul most likely has not yet fully surrendered to God 
And I agree, it is very, it's impossible when we are trying to not fully surrender and be a Christian. It's impossible. It can't be done. That's why it's so, you've got in the inside, there's a raging war going on. Satan and the forces of heaven are at battle with each other and it's all within us and it tears us apart. It's, it's impossible. When we surrender though, Satan has no foothold on us at all. None. And the peace of God can truly come into us because I don't carry that weight. I'm not God anymore. Those things all go to God. He's in the right place and He rules over all of this. And we can truly embrace surrender and peace and the fullness of God. We have access to the full victory that Christ has given us through His cross and resurrection. It's so I can't even express uh, that enough. All right, verse 3. Or I'm sorry, section 3, verse 7. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. Just basically whatever that amount was, she validated. Yep, that's what it was. So great fear came over everyone, but yet she hasn't heard about it yet. It hasn't reached her ears. It's funny how sin blinds us to the works of God even around us, even when it has to do with us. So Peter gives us here the opportunity to, to well, admit, confess, or to expose her lie and participation. It's affirmed that she was part of the lie. Um, humanity was created in God's image, male and female, in the image and likeness of God. Um, we see here that both are in it together. Isn't it interesting that in Genesis we see that it was the female that first was deceived and then turned to the male? But here it's the opposite. Now it's the male and the female also that's in on it. It's the same likeness of what's happening. It's supposed to show there's a parallel that's going on here. Again, God will protect, though, his church from the deceptions of Satan. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. And immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. We see that there isn't a fear of God here, which is really unfortunate. And the testing of the spirit of the Lord you see in Psalm 95, there's a warning. Don't, if you hear the word of the Lord today and you see his works and wonders, do not put him to the test like you did at Massah and Meribah um, and you tested him, though you saw all of his works because what he says ultimately is that those, the result of that is that they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. If you see that I'm present, then submit to me, trust me. They went to the edge of the promised land and then they, they went in, right, in the Exodus and came back and said, there's giants in there. We're, we don't got a chance. Here, isn't that a weird? I mean, that's kind of a pretty bad excuse because they just got rescued from the most powerful nation in the world. So even if there are giants in the land there, they just got rescued from Egypt and God didn't have any problem with that. So why are we worried about getting into the promised land? And that's what he's saying here. If you see that I'm among you and I'm doing works around you, embrace me, submit to me, and I will. That's that whole idea of take refuge in me and I will give you life. I will give you deliverance. I will give you my spirit. Don't forget who God is. Waiting at the door will carry you out. This is, a, um, this is a reference to Genesis 4, verses 1 through 7, where Cain and Abel together, and uh, you know, um, Cain ends up killing Abel. What it says is that uh, Cain brought an offering to the Lord, the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock. So Abel gave a better offering. It was the firstborn. It was the best. 
Abel's was, or Cain's was just an offering. Abel's was the best. So Abel's was uh, accepted. Cain's wasn't. And Cain was angry. And it, he saw, you could see it on his face. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do what's right, won't you be accepted? If you put me as God, will you not be loved by me? But he says, and if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you. It wants to master you. But you must master it. That's exactly what's happening here. The feet are at the door and they are ready to take you out. Again, this is the same thing. It's showing parallels of what's happening here. We all have a choice. Sin wants us. But so does Jesus. So does God. We have to choose which side we want to be on. So when the young men came in and they found her dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband in great fear, there it is again, came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. Isn't that interesting? Great power, great grace when things are going the way that they were intended to be and when things go against God. Great fear is what comes in. Here's the thing. We all have a choice. Like I said before, we all have a choice to either follow God, to submit to God, or to not. And that's really what we're left with. So what do we really understand that is called with, by Christians? The call from God is we get the honor to have a front row seat and watch him do what it is that he's going to do. And even if, let me put it this way, even for those that say, well, you know what? I'm not being healed or whatever the case is. I'm praying, I'm following, I'm not being healed. Let me, even no matter what happens in this life, because you can make the same argument for those that are martyred, that are killed for their faith. God has gone so far that even if we die in this life, we live eternally with him. We go home. We, we prevail regardless, period. And the life that we live in this life, we get to walk with him through all of those trials, through everything. In John eleven twenty five, 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. You will have eternal life. We get the honor of walking with God and knowing him in this life. And are we going to have troubles? Absolutely. And Jesus tells us, I will never leave you. I will never leave you as orphans. I go away to prepare a place for you and I'm coming back for you. If I'm leaving to do that, I'm coming back. He gave us the Holy Spirit. We need to learn how to embrace it. And we need to protect that. We need to honor that. We need to understand that that is who we are. And that we don't need to find our identity in things such as our money. And the, uh, God will provide. He will provide. Many of you understand that. You've gone through that. You've seen that. He provides. If we just trust Him. Do we trust Him? He wants to use us to awe people of how awesome He is. If we're so afraid of our own uncomfortableness, how can He use us? He sometimes paints this awesome black picture and we're right in the middle of it. And it's a scary place to be. It's like standing on the edge of the Red Sea, right? And the Egyptians are coming up and we're like, we're going to die. This is really bad. And God, you're the one that brought me here. It's your fault. And he says is, trust me. And he splits the sea. We get to watch that sea being split. 
We get to watch Him put the plagues on Pharaoh. We get to watch Him create the manna and provide it for us. We get to walk with Him through the desert into the promised land. So my urge to you is to remember that the story is not over yet. It's not over. But God will protect those that embrace Him and have faith in Him and walk with Him. He will protect them. He will protect this church because that is where the witness and the testimony of what His Son has done for all of humanity comes from. Amen? So the statement to wrap us up is that the Lord provides for all who have truly surrendered to Him. May we always be a people that embrace that, that truly surrender. And if we aren't there yet, then may we pray that He brings us to that place because He will. Guaranteed He will. The key is we got to stop fighting Him on it and just finally give up and say, you're God and I'm not. Amen? Let's pray. Amen.